Cancer is a growing concern in Nigeria, with an estimated 100,000 new cases diagnosed each year. Nigeria's cancer control program and plan through the Federal Ministry of Health since the year 2018 to 2022 and beyond reported that cancer is responsible for 72,000 deaths in Nigeria every year with an estimated 102,000 new cases of cancer annually. According to medical experts, the most common types of cancer in Nigeria include breast, cervical, and prostate cancer. And the question many ask is why is it claiming so many lives in Nigeria? Health records in the country indicate limited access to healthcare services, lack of awareness about cancer prevention and early detection, cultural beliefs which may lead to late diagnosis, inadequate screening programs and challenges in accessing proper treatment and care are the major reasons why. It is crucial to promote education about the importance of cancer screening, lifestyle modifications to reduce cancer risk, and improving access to affordable and quality healthcare services in order to reduce the impact of cancer-related ailments in the country. In addition, Early detection and timely treatment are also key in improving outcomes for cancer patients. This is why the federal government is committed to providing access to affordable and quality cancer treatment and care for all Nigerians. But challenges abound regardless. Many are of the opinion that given the necessary attention, there is hope for those affected by cancer in Nigeria. On Good Morning Nigeria Today, Guests will discuss the prevalence of cancer in Nigeria, the concerted effort to strengthen cancer prevention, treatment and care, as well as reducing the burden of cancer by improving the quality of life for those affected by this devastating disease. Many thanks, Ibrahim, for the background report and seated already with us in the studio to discuss the topic uh, as regards uh, cancer care is uh, Dr. Mutu Jimo, consultant, radiation and clinical oncologist from the University College Hospital, Ibado. Many thanks for joining us, doctor. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we also have uh, here uh, Dr. Evaritus Oba, a consultant, radiation and clinical oncologist uh, from the University of Benin Teaching Hospital, Edo State. Uh, good Thank to have you. Thanks for having me. Welcome. We also have uh, in our studio here, Professor Usman Malami Aliu is the Director General, National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment. Thank you for joining us, Prof. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Also, we have uh, our Zoom guest uh, we'll, we'll, uh, that will join us later in the course of the program is Dr. Adeolua Adeniji, Chief Medical Director, Mikio Cancer, will join us later. Uh, in the conversation. Now let, let's kick start the uh, conversation with uh, the DG National Institute for Cancer Research and uh, Treatment, uh, Professor Usman. Uh, cancer is the dreaded disease, just like uh, it's been reported. And uh, the, case of, uh, the cases that we have had are just too many, especially here in, the, in, in Nigeria. So what, can you give us the status of Nigeria's uh, of Nigeria as regard cancer you know, now. All right, so uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, currently what we have, uh, as I used to say, is an estimation of uh, the general burden of cancer in the country, which is, is done by uh, an agency of the Blue WHO, uh, which we call uh, Global Can, so be. So, and the estimation based on the 2020 survey that was done, is um, annually we have there about 120 to 140 new cases, cases. of cancer annually in Nigeria. This is uh, just an estimate generally from, uh, depending on where the study has been carried out. And it was also estimated that annually about 74,000 of the new cases diagnosed die because of the disease wow. yeah That's so uh, yes globally if we we look uh, in 2020 the estimation was there about 19 million 
that was uh, recorded actually in 2020 and globally globally 90 million 90 million in 2020 million. and 10 million of uh, uh, that was recorded okay. so 20 in 2020 the estimation was that 19 million new cases and then 10 million deaths so more than half of virtually if you look at that figure died from uh, the scourge of cancer estimation by a, pro a renowned professor uh, known as Pekin, he estimated that uh, the incidence of this disease is going to continue to rise. So uh, he made a clarion call to all the nations in the world that something has to be done. Because what we are seeing now in the next like two decades to come, mm. this scotch is going to double. Yes, it's going to double. And what is more saddening is that more than half of this increment is going to come from the low and middle income countries, of which Nigeria is one of them. So it's like uh, we are uh, facing a war coming. So all the countries, he made a call that all the countries, and preferably those in the low and middle income countries, should step up and start uh, um, coming up with programs and activities that will combat the menace, that will uh, start making way and putting all the check and balances that are needed to combat the scourge of this disease. But we are happy, as I always used to say, the government of the day has heard the call and have taken a drastic action by establishing an institute Okay. The National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment that is purely, purely for cancer control. Just like we have NACA and NCDC. So that is the institute that we have. An agency that is well focused for cancer prevention, cancer treatment, cancer research, and in general cancer control in Nigeria. So we have to thank His Excellency uh, 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 Ahmed Bola Tenbu for, for this very good initiative and uh, for the two good ministers that we have that are putting all their best in ensuring that the agency has operated without any hindrance, without any unnecessary interference. All right. Okay. Many, many thanks, Professor uh, Liu, uh, for your opening comments there. Of course, uh, you, you have in, increased the scare uh, because, uh, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> you said uh, low and... Uh, uh, medium income countries of course are at risk and that's uh, you know looking at the figures already scary at the moment and that's going to double so i'd like to ask dr mathieu uh, at the moment uh, it's still let's say it's still minimal you know the incidences but this is going to increase but where are we at the moment as regards uh, care and treatment uh, you know um, uh, our um, health system how effective is it at the moment in managing, uh, you know, cancer uh, uh, patients? Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. Like uh, my DG rightly said, the government is doing their best, right? Uh, unlike before, that we don't have centers handling this cancer treatment, but we have more numbers now that handle this cancer treatment. Even in addition to that, government is doing what we call cancer aid fund to assist people that cannot financially capable to access this treatment, which is a good news. Some can afford it. Some people that cannot afford it, especially they target breast cancer, cervical cancer, and prostate cancer. Right? So that if someone can apply, once they registered, they make diagnosis and then they can apply for this cancer, they will get the funding and they can have access to treatment. So numbers of centers that are treating cancers are more now compared to before. Okay. So it will be very easy for our people to just go to the hospital, right, and access this care. So it, it has, it's a different news, unlike before that we have no numbers of centers, but we have more numbers, and more are still coming. Mm. Governments are doing their best to make sure that they provide infrastructure for more centers so that every region will have access, people will have access to, to, to cancer treatment. So it has improved. 
And in addition to that improvement in terms of infrastructure, even financial capability for people that cannot afford it. It's now free? It, no, for, for three councils that I mentioned now. The, the, the support. Okay. So That's what I call cancer aid fund. Okay. Prostate cancer, cervical cancer, and the breast cancer. Okay. So people, if they are aware, they come to the hospital and they register and they apply for this cancer. That's what I'm saying. In support of the infrastructure, government are doing. We also have individuals that also established a cancer center. We call them private centers. In support of what government is doing. So to make sure that people can access this treatment. So it's a different news now compared to before. Things has improved. But we want more, more improvement. And the more are still coming from the government side. And even some private organizations too are also trying to establish because they know we need these treatment centers. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Mutiu, uh, for your thoughts there. But what you have just said is that they, 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 there is improvement yeah. in the treatment yes. and also the, the, the government has provided more centers yes. you know, for the treatment of uh, cancers. But from what the DG said now, which is a bit scary, that uh, there is likelihood to be an increase in the number of uh, cancer cases, especially in this, uh, in this climb, this, this, this part of the world. So let's go to Dr. Obo now. So how, uh, what, what do you think is responsible for this increase that uh, is being, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that they, were, they were likely to have? What, what do you think is responsible, despite all the efforts that is being put in place by the federal government to, you know, to tackle this uh, challenge? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also once for having me. The government, I have been said rightly, has done, done a lot in the area of bridging the gaps. There are so many gaps in cancer care. And this gap actually has been, I mean, made worse over time by lack of infrastructure for diagnosis, screening, and treatment. Looking at cancer, I must understand that in preventing cancer, I must look at those three key values. Okay. Looking at primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. What's primary prevention? Looking at creating awareness, you know, cancer advocacy and cancer education. But I will tell you, it's still very poor in our climb. People still don't understand what cancer is all about, the common symptoms. So oftentimes, they present very, very late, in very advanced stage. And at that point, at best, you can afford them what we call just palliative treatment. Mm. I will tell you, over 70% of patients come to us in stage three and stage four stages. This is actually what we, we have in most Western countries where they come much early. Why? Because they have infrastructure for screening, diagnosis, and treatment. Let's go to the issue of uh, pediatric tumors, for instance. If you have 10 patients that of cancer of the, of the uh, pediatric tumor, childhood cancer, in Western countries, 10 of that 10, two would, so, would die, eight will survive. But in a climb, like Jerry said, low countries like us, reverse is the case. Mm. Eight will die, two will survive. Mm. Look at the body, telling you that lack of infrastructure for screening, diagnosis, treatment has actually to a long, to a greater too much gap in cancer care. Then also comes about size on secondary screening. Very important. Secondary prevention looks at screening. If you screen, what you want to achieve is what? When you screen, you get cancer at an early stage, you cannot you cannot commence radical treatment aim of care. <coughs> so that we do over over abroad in most other developed climbs because they get this cancer at early stages where they can have all the treatment that you may have. They can have surgery, chemo, radio. You cannot achieve care for those kind of patients. But over here, most of the time, they always come in advanced. So coming at advanced stage is a Why big do you think that the, the, the patients actually come at the advanced stage? Yes. Why, 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 One why of the reasons is poor awareness. That's why I said they are not so educated by cancer and also finance. People normally face a lot of financial toxicity. They don't have the money and they have this myth about cancer. You understand? So to a large extent, the fathers, and also we have this study that people go to churches, they go to other, uh, other people. To cultural to beliefs. Cultural and beliefs, you understand? So to a large extent, they are misinformed. Village people But then they are coming to us, they see cancer as witchcraft, spiritual attack, and certain means about cancer. But they are coming to us, they've gone around the route and are coming to us in very advanced stage. All right, I'll pause you here. So with that, okay, okay. I'll pause you there. But you see, I have 
a different view as regards what you said it may not really be because uh, people um, you know have spiritual beliefs or whatever in Nigeria don't you think that our health system too is unhealthy at the moment and maybe that's why we're having people present at, at, at late cases uh, maybe there's misdiagnosis under diagnosis you know uh, in, in the part of our, of our health professionals but I, I, and my, that question is going to Dr. Adeoluwa Adeniji the Chief Medical Director Mikio Cancer Center he joins us now via zoom uh, doctor can you can you hear us I can hear you. Please, good morning. In the conversation. So, uh, you know, doctor is trying to say, well, it's the cultural practices, spiritual, you know, beliefs and all of that. But I, I tend to disagree. I think that uh, our health system is unhealthy at the moment. I think that uh, underdiagnosis, misdiagnosis are also some of the factors responsible uh, for uh, the late presentation, if you like, the death of cancer patients. What's your view? Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, so I to start by saying that uh, what you said about the misdiagnosis at the primary level are exactly a real factor. They all are factors that to late presentation to the hospital. So, uh, how do I mean there are there are cases that individuals present to maybe to the family physician or the medical doctor at the primary level. And uh, at the end of the day, the diagnosis uh, is delayed. It takes time to get these individuals to see a specialist to have the right diagnosis. And in Nigeria, especially in the government, where everybody is being taken for malaria and All right, uh, Dr. Adeniji, looks like there's a challenge uh, with your other connection there. We hope we can get that right. Uh, but uh, I think uh, Dr. Mitu uh, uh, Jimo wants to respond to my question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, I remember, if I can remember what you asked about uh, the, the, uh, the Nigerian hospitals to maybe they are contributing to where it's, a, it's not that true. What do I mean by that? Most patients, even lack of our, even learned, you'll be surprised, learned will come at stage four. Maybe due to ignorance. Right. By the time they present. Doctor, you see, <laughs> before you get to stage four, you would have presented so many symptoms that you have been treating in the hospital. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm coming so there. So if it was detected as at the time you presented the headache, or fever. Yeah, we, we where they go first matters. You understand what I'm saying? Where they go first matters. Some people believe it's, it's an evil arrow. Instead of coming to the hospital or meet any health workers, they will go to you know religious leaders, they will go to their traditional leaders first. Now, this is an, an attack. I've seen quite a number of patients that said that, even the learned. But doctor, with you, yeah. can I just um, um, just bring uh, bring up this case of yeah. uh, late Chief Gani Okay, you know he was diagnosed of cancer, okay. but it was rather too late, okay. and he complained. He said here in Nigeria, several times he went to the hospital, they never diagnosed cancer; they were diagnosing something else, you know. And when he went to the UK, that was when they found out that it's actually what he had was cancer he was really very angry because it was at an advanced stage so that's exactly what she's saying that most of the time we have wrong diagnosis here in this country mm -hmm. so how do we begin to correct that well we, the infrastructure is also very important here and the machine the equipment to make the right diagnosis at the right time because that the, the long c that you are talking about for ganifa Amy, pneumonia can simulate the same symptom like lung cancer TB can simulate the same symptom like lung cancer. So it, it can be very, they, they, they mimic. Right, somebody with lung cancer can be diagnosed as TB. It can also happen in Western so world. You agree that How? That's a gap. How? How? No, those are the things. They, 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 they mimic. They, 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 they look similar. The symptom looks similar. Okay. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Symptom of pneumonia and TB can be symptom of lung cancer too. Okay. So uh, the, the equipment, the equipment, the, the, the agents, the agent to, to make diagnosis is also very, very, very important here. Okay. 
You understand what I'm saying now? So he, he, this issue of misdiagnosis, uh, uh, they, they miss it in Nigeria. They, they miss some, somebody else, no, Dora Kiyuli, was diagnosed in Nigeria, was missing the U.S. So it could so happen anywhere. It, it, it could happen. Due to reagent, due to the machine, to, due to, you know, it could be machine error, it could be reagent error. Hmm. You understand what I'm putting across? So, so you see, was diagnosed here, and the, 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 the disease was also missed in the U.S. Hmm. Okay, there, there, there is also this case of. Uh, in, let, let me come to the DG now. The, the case of uh, lack of research and data. You know yeah. that uh, there is a lack of comprehensive cancer data and research in Nigeria, which limits the development of evidence-based cancer prevention and treatment uh, uh, in the country. What, 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 what is the government doing about that? Okay, so thank you very much for the question. Just like you have said, there has been that of data uh, for quite a very long time in the country. But um, with the establishment of this institute, all the activities of cancer registry, that's the national cancer registry in Nigeria, is under my institute now. And uh, I'll be happy to say just uh, two weeks back, we actually had a meeting, what we call uh, Cancer Registry Dialogue. Okay. We invited all the regional directors of cancer registries in the country, the CMDs, uh, chairman uh, committees of CMDs, uh, and uh, the who to uh, uh, I mean the the big shots in the area of cancer registry in Africa and even in the world. So we, 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 the African Cancer Registry Network and the International uh, Association for Research on Cancer, the IAC, they were all invited in that meeting. So the meeting was how can we resuscitate and revamp the existing cancer registries that we have in Nigeria. So they are, the dialogue went on and the, uh, the black and white paper that we were able to got out of that we have even started working on that because we realized that for quite a very long time the government wasn't in charge of the activities of cancer registry it was owned by uh, actually an individual he was the one that was managing the whole activities of cancer registry data collection for nigeria and he was doing that because he got a grant from a university outside the show in, in, in the Western countries. And uh, all that he was doing for the cancer registries in Nigeria was through this grant. And remember, a grant has a timeline. It has a time frame. So, uh, <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> when we were having that meeting, dialogue meeting, now somebody asked a question that we need to actually go back to the website of the Nigerian Cancer Registry so that we can see what, yes, that it has been dormant for quite a very uh, uh, a long time. No addition, no. I said, okay, let's log and see so that what we are doing now, we can have a clear evidence of what we are seeing so that the, behold, when we clicked, it has been crushed. Mm. So, so one of the said, directors okay. called and then he found out that the guy that was manning the whole website or platform for cancer registry said he as far as he's concerned he has finished his in fact the research has reached its own destiny that he has gotten enough data that he is required and it's more than five years now so all he needed to do is just to publish that and close down the whole thing. I said, what? So I quickly informed our, the Honorable Minister of State for Health, that is Dr. Tunja Alasa, because the, the, the institute is under him, who could now communicate it to the Honorable Minister for Health, Prof. Ali Fati. And they gave an immediate direction that you are the one in charge from now on take charge of the whole cancer registry. As I'm talking about, we, are, we, we have reached there about 90% of building a national platform for cancer registry in Nigeria. Okay. And we have it for the first time in our budget. 
a grant, a budget line to re resuscitate and revamp the cancer registries in virtually all the hos hospitals. So we even had a meeting just two days back with the international, the IAC, this is a WHO organization that is in charge of controlling data generally in the country. And we have their full support to okay. train our <laughs> cancer registry director and assist the Institute at Nigeria in building and maintaining the cancer registry. Currently, we are planning to establish a centralized pool for cancer registry. It's okay. happening for the first time, really? where all the other centers, cancer registry can network and pool okay. so that we can have a dashboard and be able to, to see the cancer incidence correctly, whether it's going up or it's or going, going down. down. Yeah, of course, how we effective need. the institute is uh, yes, yes. You know, in, in dealing with its mandate. A uh, beautiful, uh, uh, the, the Professor Adeyu, but I want to stay with you. Uh, you know, uh, w you have mentioned that, okay, well, the government is trying to scale up infrastructure. Uh, Dr. Mathieu has uh, argued that, uh, well, uh, you know, regents, you know, uh, may be faulty in the U.S. and also faulty in Nigeria, you know, and all of that. But I, I want to talk about uh, uh, professionals now in the field of uh, cancer care and treatment. Um, at the moment, there's this report that says we have just about uh, 70 consultants, radiation and clinical oncologists. You can correct me if that's not uh, uh, the right figure. Just about 70. And they're looking at the figures you've mentioned, those who have uh, cancer. Uh, uh, in the country at the moment, <laughs> this 70s, uh, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you know where I'm going to. So, 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 I mean, how, how do we scale up in terms of professionals on the field? And then ensuring that even the professionals we have at the moment have the required skill to meet up with the present realities. So, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, this affects virtually not only the oncology aspect the uh, 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 oncology doctors, it caught across virtually every other specialty because of the Japa syndrome that you have been hearing about. But um, still, uh, we have to still thank the government because just uh, last month, uh, His Excellency Ahmed Bola Tinubu gave the directive uh, to the firm, uh, uh, I mean, the coordinating minister for health and social welfare property, that he should increase the number of one doctors that we are gra graduating uh, from, uh, I think, by 100%. Yes. Yes, by 100%. Mm -hmm. And that implementation has started taking effect currently, the recruitment of more doctors. Does that left, he has given an immediate order to replace them and the waiver the federal ministry of health has been given the direct uh, the, the, the 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 power now to give waivers for virtually all recruitment just to facilitate and ease the process of recruiting new hands in the country don't forget that um training a specialist in the field of oncology is not cheap anywhere mm. in the world. In fact, if you look, it's the cheapest in the country. And the ones we have are among the best in the country. That is why we are, the people abroad are pulling them, the Western world, are poaching. So how do we discourage the, 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 this syndrome of Japa? I mean, because we have inadequate um, you know, um, manpower. So, and they are Japa. So what, what do we do to discourage so, that? So uh, uh, currently part of the things that the government is doing is to improve the condition of services okay. in the country. If we, you, you live currently just like what uh, uh, Dr. Jimo said, um, there was a time in this country that only one linear accelerator machine was working, was serving the whole population of 180 million then, if I can remember. And it was, I think, National Hospital. Oh, uh, it, uh, yes, Sokoto too, yes, because we, we were having four. And uh, during uh, Obasanjo regime, we were having four brand Linux uh, through the VIMED program. And at any single time, to you, uh, I mean, there was never a time that you can find two machine working. Virtually. How many do we have now? We have 15. How many are working? So we have there about seven 
at working at a time <laughs> yeah so 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 that is an improvement so uh, we, we 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 continue to improve from that time and during the last regime i i, I know we have added to the uh, the number of machines there were two new centers came into existence i think they are an and private center but currently i'm happy to announce to you that uh his excellency Ahmed Bolatin has given the approval to add six more okay six more cancer treatment machines to cutting across virtually all the regions in the country and not only this radiotherapy machine he has already uh, approved the provision of other key diagnostic equipment to virtually uh, add additional eight to ten centers through NSIA uh, partnership program and that currently I think even yesterday if you attended the ministerial briefing uh, Prof Pate the minister uh, coordinating minister for health he mentioned that so uh, I think we are uh, for the first time probably then uh, the country is getting it right bearing in mind that this government is only there but it's, it's less than a year <laughs> so but we are starting with six so you never can tell maybe by next year what will happen because we'll continue to add at the institute currently we have a uh, look into what is happening currently in the area of prevention treatment of cancer is quite expensive and the best way to mitigate the scotch and catch it early is through prevent prevention preventive services okay we are currently uh, trying to launch because we have that approval also from uh, the, federal, uh, the, the coordinating minister of health to establish uh, uh, screening centers in the six geopolitical region. So the institute is going to pick virtually uh, one tertiary hospital and equip and, 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 and get a clinic, what we call a prevention clinic. Before now, people have been clamoring, calling that go out for screening, go and do your screening. Routine. Where will you go and do, do the screening? So it is for the first time that we're going to have a clinic in each zone of the country where an individual, a client can walk in and have screening of all the panels of cancers that he wants in the country that is currently ongoing and in this is, is under my, my agency okay all right thank you very much uh, prof for giving us uh, details of what government is doing at least to improve the care of cancer we understand that uh, dr adiolua uh, audio is better now dr adiolua can you confirm that the audio is yes. okay now <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. If your audio is uh, better now, and I understand, I, I want to believe that you have been following the discussion in the studio here, uh, talking about the uh, cancer prevalence in, in the country and uh, some of the challenges that are being faced here. So I want you to speak to the issue of inequalities in cancer care uh, in Nigeria. Are there sufficient screening facilities in the country right now? Do you think? So, obviously, as we all know, and the truth of the matter is there are places in the country that do not have access to comprehensive cancer care. Number one reason is that it is not all the states in the country that have access to oncologists. Uh, for example, we know that there are few states in Nigeria where you, can, you have trained uh, professionals that are called radiation and oncologists who are supposed to you know, supervise and provide professional and comprehensive care uh, by working together with the other professionals. Uh, we don't have such oncologists in many states in Nigeria. If you come to states like Lagos, you have a number of them, you go to Oyo, a number of them, then we go to Abuja, we have them in Enugu and a few other places. But as we speak, 
at the moment. I can tell you that, you know, when you go to rivers, you're going to have just one of them to take care of the entire people in that state. And that is going to be a lot of problems as it were. And there are many states that don't even have a single oncology. So that is number one reason why there will be inequality in cancer care. Number two inequality is in terms of the available infrastructures there. We only have great cancer care in Nigeria. But I must say this at this point, Nigeria is, in terms of cancer care, is not getting worse. It's actually getting better. In the last four years, things have happened. So much improvements have, you know, taking place. I, I, I saw it right in front of me. In front of my face, you know, number of radiation therapy coming in with modern structure, modern care. Uh, and facilities to take care of people. So, so it significantly. Uh, then another reason is why we will have any because it is not everyone that can afford okay. cancer care all around is quite expensive. It's, you know, to have to it's quite you know, uh, expensive. The capital is huge. As a result, that so a number of these, uh, there are a number of people that cannot afford it because health insurance companies and companies, people are still doing out of pocket, you know. All right, what? Dr. Adenidi, uh, sorry uh, about that. Uh, the audio connection is still, still not so still, tidy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that uh, can be fixed. Uh, you know, maybe you could uh, alter your uh, network connection. There's been an issue with networks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, so. well, well, let's, let's come back let's, to this yeah, today, okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Obo. Yeah, Dr. Obo, uh, you know, uh, coming back to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Adenidi was trying to make a point about the cost of managing uh, cancer. Uh, you did mention, you know, as being one of the factors responsible for uh, the number of deaths experienced. Um, you know, as a as a medical practitioner, and then you get to see cases and patients. Uh, uh, what what really can be done in that regard? Because, uh, like you already said, Nigeria, we're, we're a praying nation, and nobody prays to have cancer, and then somehow it comes down, and you do not have the funds. What could be done? Uh, 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 did was trying to talk about uh, a fund. And, and all of that but we know that not all nigerians can assess that fund uh, what could be done in that regards really what can nhis uh, uh, play a role what can individuals do what can government do thank you like rightly mentioned by dg cancer treatment is quite expensive it's very expensive you know even the process of diagnosis screening and treatment are quite expensive and usually looking at our patients that come for cancer treatment often time. Quite a number of them are indigent. They don't have the resources for treatment. That can also be the reason why they don't want to come to the very first place and seek for other, maybe cheaper bits of treatment, which leads to progression and probably come to a very advanced stage. When you for say indigent, some people yeah. think that cancer is a disease for the rich. That's not true. It's not true. It is not true. <laughs> Anybody can. It doesn't, it doesn't, it costs across ages and and status. It doesn't matter. I have patients that have one year old, they have cancer. Mm -hmm. Eight years, we can have cancer. Also, the rich and poor, everybody can have cancer. It's not for the poor only, uh, it's for the rich. Uh, it's for everybody. everybody. Everybody can have cancer. So, looking at as well this cost, I'll tell you that in our experience, um, most patients that have cancer oftentimes definitely will have, at a point, have chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy. The average cost of surgery for most patients around some around for government facilities maybe around 150 to 250. That will cost more in private facilities. Then looking at chemotherapy, which actually what most of our patients actually have to take. Why? Because they come oftentimes in advanced stage requiring chemotherapy, systemic therapy. So in doing that, what's the cost? Chemo is from an average of 150 to about 200, depends on the chemo you are giving. And also, if you have to progress to higher therapies, which you call immunotherapies, those cost far more. Looking at maybe around 700, a million, and even more for each cost of chemotherapy. Then the therapy now for, like, judgment. we have private centers and government centers. In private centers, the average therapy cost for patients for breast cancer is around 1 million to 1.2 million. Then for government, it's about 800 to 1 million. So that is still too high for the average Nigerian. Here in our country, like Dr. Delmer, they pay for their pockets unlike in Western countries where they have a very functional health insurance. But over here, 
attempts have been made to actually incorporate it into the health insurance, the Nigeria health insurance. That is still being perfected. But I can assure you that cancer treatment is not wholly taken care of by health insurance. But some, some molecules you have in cancer treatment, some are taken care of partially, not completely. They pay a percentage, begin cheaper. But what companies are actually in Nigeria health insurance? That's an issue. So it's still mainly for the Still seven, those who are working, maybe in corporate bodies. But those who are doing business, how well are they represented in the national insurance? They are cut off. Then for the cancer head, cancer head fund, it's a little bit by the Ministry of Health, where we have cancer of the service, cancer of the breast and prostate, taken care of. They get a first tranche of a million naira, and that million naira, making two million naira. So it pays for everything from surgery, chemo, and even with the therapy. To a large extent, it's been, it's been, it's been availed of to many patients and even that is maximally. But not all centers actually are involved in this, in this study. So, but hopefully, like DJ said, there will be a second phase. There will be more cancers beyond just prostate, cervical, and breast, and also more centers. Now, they just start, start involved, only for are involved. And with the next center, I'm hoping that we have to start involved and I expand the scope of cancer that will be involved as well. Looking at what we can do in this area, what I believe is that we have to get government to do more. No doubt, they've done a lot, but they still have a lot to do. Like, I will tell you now, Nigeria has uh, 14 machines, eight working, but what's, what, what's the expectation? When by the high regulation, you actually have over 200 machines, mm -hmm. because it's still that you have Going one mega machine Nigeria. to one million population, mm -hmm. and we have 220 million, and we're having nine machines working, eight machines working. It's still very much below expectation. So some cities in the UK can have as much as even 10 machines, 9 machines. So right, Riley really said, we've done well, like in 2015, 16, like Riley said, Edas Oto is working today, or Bini is working uh, the other month, or Abuja is working. It kept happening that way. So we have adopted migratory pattern. All the by that, oh, Bini is working now, let's all go to Bini. Then after that time, Bini has a it problem. Oh, down. Soto is working. Oh, we all now migrate to Sokoto. You know, it was like migratory pattern of getting care for patients. Oh, Abuja is working now. Everybody moves to Abuja. You know what that means? These machines have their own limit. Yeah. They should not treat more than mm -hmm. 40, 50 patients. Mm -hmm. They're taking 150. Mm -hmm. That's a red flag for us. But you can't do, you can't, you can't stop at that point because where would they go to? So because of that, it affected Sukudu. Sukudu actually broke down. Bini had something that Bini broke down. Abuja broke down. And like Riley said, this initiative by government is very laudable, highly commendable because we're not seeing the lights. Why? For the very first time we're having 14 centers in Nigeria and eight or nine working. And we're not getting more private people involved in care. What I was saying is that let's get more people, more people into the uh, uh, more of cancer treatment, into the national cancer, uh, national, uh, national insurance, uh, health insurance one, and also expand the scope of cancer health fund. Let people now also try and also uh, know that apart from cervical breast and so you can have in the colon cancer, head and neck cancers, and that cancer that naturally just is three. So lastly, my answer would be that. We can also, apart from having more centers, you have more centers, government can also create more like a, a fund also, apart from the cancer health fund. Like you go to India, they will have the call for their, their own citizens, an indigent fund for them. They pay less. That happens. So that's why we have cancer health fund. We can do more of that too. And also um, uh, discount the cost of this cancer care. Because the continuum of cancer treatment is, is both, is both to the patient financially mm -hmm. and treatment wise mm -hmm. so because of that i think government can do more and also you can go to the tears what prevents it from having a machine so it can have machines so it's going to be left with federal government alone we can get states having their machines if you have to having their machines you don't have that you no know, machines of course we're going to have more centers and of course the cost will go down government intervention now becomes more affordable and available okay. people can assess care of cancer and have better outcome Right now, the outcome is still very far from what we actually want to achieve. Nigeria deserves more. Okay. Like, uh, I was in Tanzania, and that was some time ago for a training program. And retirement in Tanzania is free. Once you diagnose, uh, the, uh, as an, uh, you are having retirement free. Free. Because that's because what the government actually is doing. They give the center enough funds to take care of that. Nigeria can do that as well. We have the funds. So I will commend the present government, and I think they, they've done enough. But they can also, they, they've done well, but they can do more in that area. People are still having poor outcome. People are still dying from cancer, avoidable deaths because they are coming advanced and they cannot afford treatment. Okay. So I think our government to do more, like they're doing the right, like Jerry said, establishing more centers involving cancer health. Cancer health should also be 
I mean, expand to involve other cancers and also okay. other centers as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Obo, for uh, providing solutions to some of the issues that you have raised there, which is, uh, uh, with, and I think the government is listening, and I think that they will do the right thing. Let's move to Dr. Muti Ujimo now, uh, because uh, some of the issues that he raised earlier is the issue of stigmatization, cultural beliefs, and how do we become, uh, begin to overcome you know, these challenges? Because most times, just like he said, people will go to churches instead of going straight to the hospital to first you know, make the complaint. And before they realize it, maybe it's not working. They now go to the hospital and they now discover that it has gotten to the fourth stage or the fifth stage. Uh, I mean, it, uh, so, so how do we begin to, you know, uh, turn, you know, begin to change okay. people's orientation? Yeah. Thank you very much. Is it uh, part of uh, awareness is what we are doing here? Mm. Creating awareness, educating people. That cancer is not a stigmatized disease. It's not a death sentence. Right. It's because people come late. That's what causes problem. So we need to educate people not only in schools. We go to religious places, we go to community to educate people. People need education. People need counseling. They need to know that cancer is not, it's a non-communicable disease, but it's not, it's, it's, not a, it's not a stigmatized one. People believe it's, it's, once you have cancer, you are abandoned. No. So education, education, counseling is key. Not only, like I said, not only in schools, but we go reach out to the community, reach out to the religious leaders, during the church service, during the Muslim Islamic uh, services, we need to also bring it, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes to talk about it. People need to hear, and hear over here. Then apart from mass media, you know, radio, TV, television, news, uh, social media, apart from that, we still need to go to enter the communities, enter the church leaders, talk to people, because they need to tell our people. They need to know. I said it that learned fellow. Ignorance. Mm. Ignorance. A, a stage four, a, 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 somebody who is a learned come in stage, stage four. You'd be surprised. So, so, education, counseling, and our people need to also change their attitude to listen to all this awareness when we are creating it. Listen to news. When do they want to talk about health, health education, people need to create time to listen. It's very important. People don't, they ignore it. What, if it's another thing entirely, they will listen to that one. But health education is key. So that we know we can change our lifestyles. So we have to improve. What about our diet? Yes, diet, oh, when there are some cancers that diet are very implicated. We talk about processed food. We encourage people to take more of, you no know, normal diet, you know, stay away from processed food. The book says processed food, do it in moderation. When you say processed food, can you just... Well, we are talking about something smoked food, okay. all this refined food, mm. you know. So, and, uh -huh, so, and those are the ones that are implicated. So that people should do it in moderation. If you cannot afford it, they do it in moderation. And do more of fruit and fruit and vegetables, you know, exercise, you know, to change our lifestyle. There's no reason for Africa to smoke or take alcohol. No reason. Okay, that's that's contestable. That's contestable. <laughs> But, but you see, but you see the, the, the thing because there's a percentage yeah. that if we stop smoking or alcohol, yeah, that's a reduction. Mm. Okay. There's a reduction. Okay. Because we know that smoking and alcohol are implicated in almost all cancers. But this problem, you know, there's this, you know, this high cost, you know, in uh, food now, especially uh, um, what is called vegetables, fruits, and all that. And the people are complaining seriously that they can hardly afford to, you know, buy such. In, in this situation that we are in right now, what would you, how would you advise? Thank you very what much. What would you tell You are Nigerians? talking about cost of food. There are yes. some vegetables that you can just grow in your compound. Okay. Water leaf, bitter leaf, you know. These are the part of what we are talking about. This issue of costing is not only limited to Nigeria alone. Mm. People are just making noise. Hmm. Abroad is more. It's global. Yes, it's a global thing. So the little one that we can afford, we go for it. Kukumba, Gadi they, they are cheaper ones. Mm. All right, thank you, Dr. Jim. And that's uh, the direction the First Lady is actually looking at, you know, home gardening. Home having, gardening. You know, people 
uh, having to plant certain things in their homes. But away from nutrition and uh, diet and how we could uh, be able to, you know, uh, uh, prevent ourselves from from getting cancer, Doctor Aleo. I'd like to get to you now, and uh, because you mentioned prevention earlier, that is uh, key. If Nigeria can get that right, I think that uh, uh, care and treatment will just be uh, something we can wave off uh, with our hands. Uh, for example, cervical cancer. A report says that 99 percent of uh, uh, 99 percent uh, of uh, cervical cancer is actually preventable, and is the second leading cause of death. So, I mean, you just place it. It's preventable, but yet uh, second leading cause of death. So it means that something is wrong as regards prevention. Now, what can we do in that regards? And then uh, you talked about uh, scaling up infrastructure. But I'm, I'm wondering, uh, a lot of Nigerians do not have access to secondary or tertiary health uh, institutions in this country. I tried to mention that our health system is unhealthy earlier. And that's because a lot of people, uh, majority of Nigerians have access to a primary health care. <coughs> do we have cancer, um, you know, um, is, there, is there anything that has to do, because I, when I talked about misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis, it, it starts from there. You have a headache, you go to the primary health care, they don't know anything about cancer there. All they have is uh, probably uh, someone who just uh, did uh, small teaching practice in nursing, who, who knows nothing about cancer, and then you keep going there for one year, two years, and then before, I mean, so what are you doing? to ensure that it's not just in the secondary or tertiary institutions that you have cancer treatment uh, and uh, detection, it, it, it trickles down. No. So thank you very much. Maybe uh, let me start with that. It's, it's a very good question, actually. Um, at the Institute, uh, under the Directorate of uh, Cancer Prevention and Control, we have actually outlined the activities that we're going to do. In this year, 2024, you know, we have launched our strat five year strategic cancer control plan for the country. A review of that of the 2018 to 2022. We have reviewed, we have a more recent one now uh, for five years going up, up to the year 2027. So it's a part of the activities that we are planning to do in this 2024. In that department is to upscale the activities of cancer prevention activities and the first thing we did was we have recognized that and I, I actually don't know whether you uh, uh, maybe you must have gone through our act <laughs> that was why you are bringing that uh, one of the things is that the Institute is expected to to actually uh, establish or manage uh, or run a kind of uh, cancer preventive services in all the primary healthcare services within the country. So uh, when uh, the new executive director of the National Primary Healthcare uh, Development Agency was appointed, Dr. Mui well, Aina. Uh, prof, we just, just a moment. Okay. Uh, we'll, just, we'll, we'll need to go for a break now. When we come okay. back, we'll continue from where you start. We'll okay. take a break now. The conversation continues. Stay with us. You're welcome back. You're still on to Good Morning Nigeria, and uh, we are still on uh, the conversation, uh, the treatment and prevention of cancer in Nigeria. Before we took, uh, went on break, uh, Prof, the DG, was uh, speaking on uh, Larry's question that is making the treatment of cancer available at the primary care levels. Can you just continue? All right, so thank you very much. So, um, uh, there are about a month ago, also under the directive of uh, the Coordinating Minister for Health, we had a meeting with uh, the Executive Director of the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, uh, a closed door meeting actually. Uh, and one of the key things that we have discussed is how can we uh, establish a screening for the five common cancers in Nigeria within our primary health care services. And uh, part of uh, arising from that discussion, currently we have uh, actually established like a committee consisting of uh, those from the prim National Primary Health Care and the NICRAT, the National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment. So we are currently working on that because uh, what we have, the uh, caliber of uh, the healthcare workers that we have there, are either nurses or uh, CHU, community health 
extension workers. Um, what we intend doing is uh, to train them, to train them on, on virtually uh, how to give awareness on cancer education, the common cancer, so that maybe during the routine pra, uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, antenna ANC clinic and some other activities, they were able to educate the community on the sign and symptoms and the risk factors of common cancer and then teach them to be able to carry out simple examination like breast self-examination which is known to have actually saved a lot of life because it, uh, 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 it makes the detection of breast cancer very early and at, and at that stage that it can be cured. So when we establish that and train them on how to do breast self-examination, a simple pap smear, and to also uh, link those primary healthcare center to a nearby oncology center that is an establishment of a standard referral system, which they already have, but this time around for cancer, we want to strengthen that. So if we do that, definitely we know there is going to be remarkable improvement in the number of early presentations in the country and a lot of people can be saved. So we have been doing that. Why we decided to actually uh, uh, start this preventive clinic services is because uh, initially the, uh, uh, we, we wanted to say, okay, let's start with the primary healthcare and then secondary and then the tertiary but just like you rightly said we now look at now if we you now plan to take these gadgets to the remote areas they don't have the enough mom power that is required to man the process sometimes if light could be an issue so what we said is before now, we don't have any screening clinics in the hospitals. There is no hospital that you can walk and say, okay, I want to get myself screened, and then you can get, maybe you can start, uh, 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 people will be trusting you, okay, which type of screening, or you want to do pap smear, you have to go to the guy. Is it breast up examination or breast up? You have to go to either an oncologist or department of surgery. So we want to actually establish a one-stop shop clinic for screening services, where from there you can have um, a health education program on all cancers, the risk factors, the uh, common signs, and how can you prevent yourself. If you need the screening services, you have them here. Within the, the doctor there will see you and recommend and give you a paper where you can go and so that it makes it easy. Yes, yeah. you know? uh, uh, talking about making it easy, mm. are there alternative or if you like traditional, uh, you know, forms of cancer treatment? Alternative. Yes. Yes. There are a lot. And uh, when when, when uh, Doctor Jim was answering his question, I, w I was just laughing. When I was um, uh, in Sokoto, when I was fully in the clinical practice. Um, for my master's degree, I conducted there is one uh, study that I conducted. Uh, is uh, and currently that paper is. is uh, I mean, a lot of people have been asking to get the paper. Is the use of complementary and alternative medicine among cancer patient. So the prevalence that I got was quite shocking. More than sixty percent of all the patient more than 60 percent their first point of call was this complementary and this complementary could either be what the traditional house the prayer house that we have the care for the different types you know we have them different types so usually the uh, our people we still have a very long way to go in the area of uh, awareness to enlighten people more they believe and the attachment that people have with their religion is something is, is actually a no-go area because even if you start to <laughs> uh, i mean a kind of advise people on you know this thing that you have is ah, no, my brother is god oh, even if i don't even come to the hospital and take the medication well, it's god that heals so we have that and that can 
be taken away from us. But what he rightly said is, we have to have a way of engaging the, the prayer house, the community leaders, where these people go. And even the gatekeepers, because the gatekeepers plays a very important role. When we say the gatekeepers, we are referring to those people within household, within community, that people listen to, okay. that have say. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, okay. DG. Uh, we need to have enough uh, uh, contact with all these uh, traditional rulers, religious le leaders that are engaging with the, the communities. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let, let me come to uh, Dr. Obo now. And um, mm -hmm. my question would be, do we have enough support services, you know, in regards to uh, cancer? When I, when I, what I mean is that, um, do, it, 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 do we have, uh, you know, an available, you know, uh, cancer for, uh, services that are available for cancer patients in Nigeria, such as, counseling, palliative care, or survivorship program? Do we have enough? Okay, thank you. Um, we have. We have no doubt we have in Nigeria. We have, uh, although we don't have uh, um, a hospice, which you are aware of, but some centers have functional palliative units, and they also have uh, psychology clinics, and also we also have some support groups for patients. I I recall during the training you see Shibadon, we had a very functional palliative unit, understand? Patient comes to you and oftentimes, you know, if this uh, I mean advanced case and you understand the fact that this at best you can give palliative care. There's no there's no plan to achieve a cure. You know, you have to make them understand that this end journey for the patient, you know, you have to carry the caregivers along because they also are as diverse as the patient are. So you don't just really focus on the patient alone, you know. Oftentimes, they do run around, they do the patient's personal care, and they feel the pain, either as siblings, as parents, or as children, to an ill patient with cancer. So they are giving good palliative, I mean, I mean care, or work or end of life care for those patients, you know. And even the treatment too, you also have to also modify your treatment to suit your palliative intent. If you're going to give some treatment, you don't want to be too aggressive, you don't want to be too radical, because at that point, they respond, they get to, they get to have more toicity, they have to have more adverse effects when they're also more advanced than even the ones that are also early and also more fit. So because of that, we have palliative care in the country, but I will tell you that most centers they don't operate a functional palliative system, just with forces centers. Then looking at the aspect of the psycho-oncology psych clinic is very important. We have it some centers well in Nigeria, but out there there are still very few centers having functional oncology clinic. What we do actually is to help the patient understand the treatment journey for cancer. It can be very traumatic, for them it can be very I mean, devastating, and they don't even understand the journey. You know, it starts from you're in the clinic, you're told now you have cancer. Everything changes for you. You the know, do you even mention? That yes, word, diagnosis. No, everything changes for you. You start asking <laughs> it's yourself. Like a death sentence. Yes, you start asking yourself. No, the belief that the death sentence. And like Jimon, you know what I rightly said, it's not a death sentence. It's not. We've seen many people with money for cancer that are doing very well. Ten years, ten years post of their standing, working, and now, and now, cancer or other people. So, what we do, in my center in Benin, well, we try to bring them on. We bring survivors. They tell this patient, your journey today. I have gone through your journey. I've been there. I had surgery. So one of them came last month and told them how he was sent to Sokoto in 2015, 2016. You know, he met the doctors there and he was referred back to Benin. That was in 20, and now he's standing almost 10 years. You know, the journey can be so devastating. Completely free from yeah, medication? Yeah. No. yeah, 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 yes. So the patient is at least more familiar with. So, so it, it tells you that we have to, we have to, we have to do more in diet of oncology. Like in beginning, when we do that, we tell them what are your concerns, what are your worries, what are your, what are your myths you feel about cancer, what are your worries about nutrition. Let them they express their mind to us, and we try to allay their fears. We try to encourage them on that journey. Treatment, cancer treatment journey is an easy journey for anybody. Mm. So, and those that have gone through it, we get them together and we meet them. Tell other people how they did their navigation through the system, all the treatment points, and now they are back and they are well and yeah. strong. It right. gives it gives them courage for the journey. It gives them hope and strength for the journey. Because at any point they can easily be discouraged. 
mm. even by a friendly doctor mm -hmm. not because of you as a patient maybe something mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. oh I, well, because i don't have there's no hope for me or maybe a nurse that may have a bad day or there's a strike but there's a strike you know <laughs> so 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 it makes them feel as if oh i said it you understand so we must claim up most that, that my, my my advice is that let more centers have psychology clinics okay. it's very important it complements the commissioner clinic okay. yeah they're able to interact with doctor freely we allay their fears reassure them okay. that they join that others have gone through and you to also go through it and come out with a with a with a positive uh, oh, testament oh. so uh, uh, so i think it's a good thing for us that more centers for that then for the support groups we've had people that actually have been coming with support they bring money so in our center we give our uh, you know, give them refreshment in being we do that for them okay yes and it's good for them they do you do that anybody <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can talk about to that <laughs> about refreshment i know women like refreshment a lot uh, yes is, is that is that why the report that we have shows that uh, there are more women who suffer from you know the cancer than, than men no, is, is no. cancer gender <laughs> no, 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 insensitive no, no, no. no respect for anything uh, no, I, i'm, I'm, I'm yes, quoting so a figure i'm quoting a figure okay uh, there's a figure from 2020 that states that uh, Estimated 78,000 Nigerians died as a result of cancer-related okay. uh, complications. And then it says that 44,000 were females, okay. while 34,000 were males. You, you, know, you know, women, compared to men, come to the hospital. Men, you see the way they are making noise about breast cancer. How many prostate cancer did you hear noise about? For men, I don't know. So they die silently. <laughs> they, don't, they don't, but women will come. Okay. But men who just silent on the people are making noise about breast cancer, breast cancer. Nobody is talking about breast cancer. Breast cancer. They, they do talk about it, but maybe not as much. As much as breast. So for women, women will come. But men, I don't know. We don't know. We don't know for no reason that people that's just our, silent. That's our package. That's how we're packaged. <laughs> so so do you understand what I'm saying? So so those are the things. And cancer that like we are saying has no respect for age or your social status or your race. You know, or your so, so how do we encourage the men to now come out? How do we educate them? How do we encourage? We them continue to, come to out make noise mm. through mass, you know, you know, media, communities, you know, religious leaders to tell people that they, should, they need to come out once they see any changes in their body. You don't need to wait. You need to visit hospital, like DG said, primary area, and if we have a screening package there, they can link them to secondary institution tertiary institution you know from there because screening is cheaper compared to want to manage yeah, the disease right. mm -hmm. and when you pick a disease at the screening level you can re equally eradicate it or cure it than when it is not symptomatic yeah. because screening makes you are just taking people that are healthy you know you want to check you know so we need to continue to make no security awareness that men too need to come out as women are coming out because prostate cancer is the leading in men. Why we have breasts in women? Beyond making the noise for people to come out for screening, also making it uh, uh, readily accessible uh, is also key. Because I remember when uh, HIV was an issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you get into the hospital, that's like the first thing they do. Yes. All right. Uh, everywhere you go. It, in fact, they come to open, they come to the markets. They come everywhere. You know. And, and and so people people mm. got involved, and then people got to know their status. So for cancer, if you have that kind of awareness, and of mm. course you match it with that kind of action, of course a lot of people will get uh, tested, mm. or if you like, get screened, mm. and they would know their status. Uh, but talking uh, about uh, you know how we could you know solve this problem, uh, uh, Professor uh, Aliu. Uh, you know, we've talked so much about uh, this disease. Uh, if people come out for screening and you get them uh, screened and then they have mm. cancer, another block, w we already mentioned it, but I want you to tell us what government is planning to do or is doing at the moment. Is that issue of funding? I mean, nobody, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't save for, to treat a, a disease. And, and then uh, sometimes, uh, looking at the present economic realities, people cannot, they cannot even raise the money whichever way. He talked about a particular country uh, that uh, cancer treatment Asana. is completely free. Mm. Mm. What is government planning to do just so that we can reduce the cost reasonably mm. and it can be, you know, affordable and if you like, completely free? All right. So, um, uh, 
Thank you very much. He he actually started tackling the 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 question, uh, but let me add to what he he actually said. Uh, some component it's amazing you to know that some component of cancer treatment which got across surgery even the diagnosis and chemotherapy are covered by nhis the problem we have with nhis is coverage what is the percentage of even those that are not suffering from cancer even yeah are covered by NHIS and that is what currently the coordinating minister for health and the the new DG of the NHI Ekelechi are working to actually drastically improve the coverage so that at least we can have more Nigerians on that for long we are stocked around there about five to seven percent which actually is not telling good of if you go to tanzania where he mentioned you can see 80 or even 90 percent of the populace healthcare financing is actually not free anywhere in the world so the country must come in and i'm happy currently uh, i think during the media briefing uh, there is uh, i think within the span of just this at years we have like there about 800,000 increment in the number of recruitment and it continues to go up because the honorable minister for health and the dg they are currently mapping out a strategy a better way of taking it to a remarkable number that the nigerian will actually get so some form of cancer care are being covered by nhis the only problem is coverage we had a uh, series of meetings so a few months back with the dg and what we are trying to do is to bring radiotherapy into that and radiotherapy too has been inculcated into it currently so the push will be now to improve the coverage okay. so that at least even the people in the local community come benefit from that he mentioned of cancer health fund is an initiatives of the federal government okay. and currently the the cancer health fund is under NICRAT yeah it's being co-managed the uh, uh, NICRAT is an agency of the federal government under the federal ministry of health we are co-working closely to see how we can rip up uh, so perhaps it is a contributory kind of fund so the government will put something into it and then the other well-meaning Nigerian the rich and the business people within the country can also come and donate okay. to this indigent oh, cancer right. oh, oh, and we oh, have oh, already oh. set a machinery okay. for that on okay. how to reach out thank, to them. Thank you very much, DG. Let me just, uh, just because <coughs> of our time now, before we round up, let me just bring in uh, Dr. Obo now. You know, earlier on, you are talking about to have a, a wider coverage. Earlier on, you talked about the issue of collaboration between the federal and the state government in regards to level of intervention and collaboration what should be the responsibility between the state and the federal government as regards this level of intervention and collaboration yes like i rightly mentioned the infrastructure apparently for both diagnosis treatment they are, are just uh, inadequate for the country the populace and then uh, i also mentioned if i will not have private individuals having uh, retherapy centers and some are having partnership with federal government like you have in Lutz another center like UN Tishinogo as well so I also believe that incorporating the states would to a large extent help to I mean um, have had this, 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 this discrepancy in the sense that each states can have retherapy machines in each states you'll be talking of having as much as over 30 machines we need over 200 machines. So if state can, I mean, what we collaboration want, manpower training. State may not have the manpower, but federal can help to train these people, train at a level of probably cancer diagnosis, screening and treatment. Like I said, it's very diverse. We have radiation oncologists, we have medical physicists, 
We have uh, therapy radiographers, nurse oncologists, biomedical engineers. So that's why you have to have that actually makes a team to manage cancer. Mm. So it's a lot. You have to train every one of them in that area. So it means that in the area of training, we can actually have to train personnel who can actually support the state in running these services. Yeah. Why, yes. why they can partner in acquiring the machines. So when the states, I'm talking about, it's a lot of money for the machines, oh. but they can also partner in sourcing and in getting the funds to get the machines and in training of personnel to operate and the centers. Because of time, we'll have to leave it at that point. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Barito Zobo, consultant, radiation and clinical oncologist, University of Benin, for joining us for the conversation. Thank you. Uh, of Thank course, you. Uh, Dr. Mathieu Jumo, consultant, radiation and clinical oncologist, University College Hospital, Ibado. A pleasure you. to have you. Thank you. So, I have uh, two of uh, the very few oncologists uh, with me in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, Professor Usman Malami Ali, DG National Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment. Uh, a pleasure to have you again. Yeah, it's uh, course, uh, Thank uh, you uh, we do me. appreciate Dr. Adele Lua Adeniji, Chief Medical Director of Miki uh, Cancer Center. Unfortunately, network uh, couldn't uh, help us interact uh, uh, properly. I'm sure some other time we'll present a better opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, so. Well, that's how we. This is where we draw the curtain for today's conversation. There will be more next week. Uh, thanks for staying with us, and do have a pleasant weekend. I am Adimola Adouye. And I'm Henry John.